Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Lost in the Wasteland, my weekly show where I ha interview a particular person and we get a little bit of perspective on their perspective on movies. So I appreciate having Ian on here who has previously been on my other show, but now this isn't a, us sitting there talking about a particular film, we're going to be talking about Ian and his perspective on movies, so welcome aboard. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, that was a lot of fun doing 2001. Um, yep. I feel like this is more of a glass of whiskey and a cigar conversation, whereas that was like a really academic, get like get the glasses out and, well, actually, I believe. <laughs> I just shaved yesterday. Stroking our beards. I'll uh, stroke these <laughs> yes. on the side. <laughs> Do the best I can. Brilliant. <laughs> but... And if you'd like to talk about anything that you'd like to shamelessly plug for our audience so they could find you and all things you have to do with movies. Yeah, so I think the, the most common place to find me is in the Cinema Sins universe. So um, I work for a YouTube channel called Cinema Sins. Um, so I'm a writer for them. Um, so you'll that's on Twitter and through those guys is the place you'll see me most. But I have my own podcast, an Englishman and an Irishman go to the movies. Surprise! I like to talk about movies. So there you go. yeah, you can find me there or on Twitter is the best place to have a chat. Well, I think you found your place to the right place. So yes, and we're going to so. be talking about movies. <laughs> and I always like to get started with the first question, which is probably the question that most film fans and cinephiles get asked the most. Mm -hmm. Ian, what's your favorite film? It's It's not obscure. It's not intellectual. It's it's not Kubrick. It's not Hitchcock. It's Back to the Future. There you go. <laughs> that is my all-time favorite movie. That is, it is a comfortable pair of pajamas. Um, I watch it once a year on my birthday, at least. So that <laughs> is my my birthday film where I'll, I'll get a get a takeout, I'll get a pizza, and I'm I'm not going to be disappointed. There's no risk there. I know I'm going to have a good time. Um, there you go. I, I can't count how many times i've seen this movie well and i put back to the future with films like jaws and jurassic park yeah. that are like very much genre films but mm -hmm. i think sometimes don't get enough credit for how great of a film they are and <laughs> there's very few films like back to the future that is so detail oriented and all the things that you can see in just the background or in the forefront and just yep. all the details and all the time travel logic, just so much thought went into it. Just talk about pines. Or the, was and it it's still, yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, the Twin Pine Mall and then Lone Pine Mall because he drives yep. into one of the saplings. That yep. is a stroke of genius. It's so good. So, so good. And, and it is internally consistent. Most yeah. of the time travel, they set out their law and they kind of stick to it, I think, for the most part. But yeah, you're right. It's one of those films that surpasses the genre because you could ask a random person on the street, do you like sci-fi? And they may say, oh, no. And then, well, do you like Back to the Future? Oh, yeah, I love Back to the Future. They won't realise that they're watching a sci-fi film. It's just a great film. Exactly. And it's funny because it's like two of those that I brought up were Spielberg, this is Zemeckis, and he has definitely had his fair share of great films, but like, don't know the last time he yeah. had a really great film, to be honest, but like, it's something special to watch. Uh, Zemeckis, yeah. It is, whenever I see Zemeckis on a film, I'm immediately interested because I'm just like, what if? What if we get a little bit of Back to the Future? We get some of that magic. But um, did did he do the, the Shrinking Man film with Matt Damon? Was that? Oh, I think that was. I don't. Is it Alexander? Is it Welcome to Welcome to Something? Um, the Shrinking Man with Matt Damon was downsizing. He did Welcome yeah, to Marwin with Marwin. Steve that's Crowell. the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, Steve Crow. That's the film I'm thinking of. I don't know why that feels. I guess it's because he's playing with a toy, a miniaturized world himself, isn't he? Yeah. I, th I think, well, I think they were both very ambitious films that came mm. out. They didn't come out the same year, but like within... Relative. Quite similarly, yeah. Yeah, yeah within I, a few years. I think they both shot their shot, 
and I don't know if a whole lot of people made the basket. Yeah, (laughs) they committed. They they swung big, but we're not quite sure where the ball went. (laughs) Exactly. We saw it go up. Yes. We don't know where it fell down. (laughs) Or who it hit on the way down. Exactly. Now, Ian, what's your earliest memory of going to the movies? You're gonna you're gonna really, really quickly see a theme in the movies that I've picked here. So my this may not be the first film that I ever saw at the at the at the cinema, but um it was Star Trek Insurrection with my dad, and this was in 1998. Okay. Um so that's my earliest memory. And the only real memory I have of have of it is me being giddy because it was the first Star Trek that I'd seen on the big screen. Yeah. I was too young to have seen um, uh, First Contact. Um, so I was just giddy. I loved it. Every single second of it, I was lapping it up. Now, Insurrection is a bit of a maligned Star Trek film. I It always has a special place in, in my heart, and I, I love it as, as a piece of Star Trek. But yeah, I'm, not, I'm kind of on an island. And my dad is definitely not on the island with me. And I remember as we left the cinema, he said, it's just kind of a long episode, wasn't it? <laughs> Well, I was actually going to ask you if it was one of the even or the odds. Yeah, so that kind of gets, that works for the Kirk films, but then it gets derailed in the the Next Generation films because technically, no, it it does work because Generations would be an odd, which is bad. First Contact would be an even, which is good. And Interaction would be an odd, which is bad. So yeah, but then Nemesis isn't great. Pack that on at the end. Yeah, we'll just stick that there somewhere. Um, but yeah, I took that as a compliment because I was like, but dad, isn't that what we want? Don't we want more episodes of The Next Generation? And he was like, no, I want a movie. <laughs> That's fair. I So to be honest, my first real experiences with Star Trek were the J.J. Abrams movies. <gasps> right, I'm out. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, I... That's so true. That's so true for a lot of people. That was their their modern gateway into Trek, which is awesome. Because I didn't have anybody in my life that liked Star Trek growing up. So, like, it was, like, my mom didn't watch, my grandparents didn't watch, and my brother wasn't interested in it. Like, I grew up watching Star Wars. That's definitely mm-hmm. something that I saw all the time. Yeah. But, like, I never watched Star Trek. And then I remember buying Star Trek 2009 for $5 mm-hmm. used at my university bookstore. Nice. And then I watched it. I'm like, this is really cool. Yeah, this is, is great. It's is great this movie. what Star Trek is? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic, but it's com- it's it's essentially independent. Like they have weaved it into the canon, but um, I love it. I I still get giddy when um, it, it's seeing the the modern effects on uh, on on a franchise that I'm just so used to being kind of stuck in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then you have Star. Trek into darkness. Yeah. No punctuation. Nope. No, just, no punctuation just here. Yeah. And I I enjoyed Beyond. I will admit they ruined that uh, marketing campaign for that movie. Because man, they just wanted to get that film out. They they didn't put any thought into how to market it at all. That film is way better than anything surrounding it. Beyond is just a standalone bizarre star trek adventure it's really good really really good well and now like i've seen sporadic episodes of the original series and next generation Mm -hmm. i watch lower decks all the time which oh that's great (laughs) which it's like i've watched every episode so far and i'm up to date on the show and it's just like oh that's amazing it's like obviously i don't get all the references that they're making but it's still fun I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching Star Trek since I was in the womb, and there are references where I'm just like, I feel inferior. Like I've clocked thousands and thousands of hours of Star Trek, and I, I bow in the the knowledge of um, Mike McMahon, who's the showrunner, and the yeah. stuff that he pulls out. I'm like, hats off to you, sir. Well done. Well, and I've watched. I've gone back and watched, I saw Star Trek, the motion picture. So I did Mm -hmm. see the original film, which I don't necessarily have anything against the plot or anything, but like, boy, does it take its time. They're still filming it now. 
Yep. <laughs> it's still in production. It's actually um, similar to Spaceballs, where yeah. Lord Helmet <laughs> and Colonel Sanders are standing there just like, yep. that just happened. It happened now. What do you mean? It just passed. It just went. Yep. Th- that's <laughs> it. That's exactly it. Still going. But I loved Wrath of Khan. Oh, oh so good. So great. I haven't gotten around to watching, you know, the ones after, mm-hmm. but like, I've seen those two and like, if Khan is Star Trek at its best, I want to see more Star Trek. Oh, and- it is a hundred percent. Again, it's one of those films that surpasses the genre. Like mm-hmm. I, even I forget that I'm watching a sci-fi film because it's a, it's just a good versus bad movie, but it's so, so good. And it, it manages to satisfy the, the fans that saw the origins of Khan in the original series. And yep. you can just go into that film with no context at all and still appreciate it. Well, all I need to see is Ricardo Montalban, and I know he's like a superhuman or something, right? Just chewing up scenery. Yeah, <laughs> superhuman. He tasks me. <laughs> he just eats every line. <laughs> oh, so great. So um, good. <laughs> and... Not gonna lie, I so like I have Paramount Plus, and I'm like, I need to watch more stuff with this because like I'm mm-hmm. paying for this. I started watching Picard, and I'm like, I like it. I don't know everything going on. <laughs> yeah, even more so than Lower Decks, you need some context for Picard. You need to have seen Nemesis, which is the last TNG movie, uh-huh. and kind of Star Trek 2009, the reboot. Um, because it pulls a lot from those two films. Um, yeah, basically, I know yeah. Nemesis had Tom Hardy in it. Correct. That's my extent of my knowledge. That's of Star Trek all you Nemesis. need to know. That's it. Yeah, that's all you need to know. That's it. <laughs> He's the best um, part of that film. What's easily. interesting is we definitely talked a lot about genre so far. So, Ian, do you have a particular favorite? Uh, yeah, romantic comedy is actually my favorite. No, it's it's sci-fi. <laughs> you had me for like half a second <laughs> just right a there. little bit yeah no it's science fiction um it's the it's a bit of a cheat because you can have everything within that you can yeah. have romantic comedy under that you can have his- historical stuff under that like 2001 a space odyssey is a history film <laughs> it's a history man um, it is. and like 2001 is like like that is like hard science fiction yeah and that like, is a university lecture so like i remember getting 2001 for the first time it was a tcm master's classic set that i bought from nice. barnes and noble and it was that forbidden planet which is also like hard yeah, science fiction yeah, yeah yeah and like if star trek is all about freud <laughs> And the id and stuff like that. I'm like, boy, is this one. And it's so funny watching Liam ne- uh, uh, Leslie Nielsen in it. Who said Liam Neeson? Yeah, Liam Neeson, oh. close. <laughs> oh, remake it, put Liam Neeson's in it. it. I'm down. Yeah. Got my money. Everything. Him and Tom oh. Hardy. Let's do it. <laughs> but like Leslie Nielsen in it, because like I saw Airplane. <laughs> yeah. It's like a uh, police squad. I'm just like, yeah. so, why so serious? Yeah, what happened? And it also had the original Time Machine with Rod Taylor in it. I love that film. Me too. Unironically, it's a good film. And then it wasn't my first, but it was one of my many Charlton Mm -hmm. Heston science fiction films, Soylent Green. Nice. I definitely watched Planet of the Apes a lot growing up. Mm -hmm. So like, I remember one of my New Year's was I watched all of them. Like that, nice. like the original and all the sequel movies. But there's like 45 of them. <laughs> there's actually a only lot. four sequels. But it just like, feels it's, like a lot more. <laughs> it's a strange, <laughs> like Ricardo Montalban's in it. Yeah. Two of them, at least. But like science fiction is so interesting because like you can have all the post-apocalyptic things. Mm-hmm. You have the hard science fiction, very like robotics kind of thing yeah. technology could have action sci-fi which like basically is all of marvel yeah pretty much i mean iron man is is science fiction um minority report springs to mind as it's an action film but there is a heavy amount of sci-fi in that 
Yeah. Um, it just it adds a layer to whatever film you're making. I'm I'm just like you've made this film. Why isn't it more sci-fi? <laughs> There's <laughs> always a room. Little, like, what if the romantic lead was a robot? Well, exactly. Exactly. Uh, what's the um, ex machina done it? <laughs> so that is one of my favorite films of the past ten years, and yeah. Alex Garland. And Annihilation, also science fiction, also yeah. terrifying. <laughs> he did that. That bear, that sc- the bear monster that screamed, "Nope, no, thank you." No. I remember sitting in the theater, <laughs> and because like I was one of like five people who saw it in a theater in America. <laughs> yeah, and <that's>, everyone <laughs> else just got it on money. Netflix. No, and that was one of those times where everyone just like got up and left. There's like no yeah. reaction. It was just like, uh, I'm out. <laughs> Okay. I was watching. I I knew it was coming um, because somebody had spoiled it for me. But they'd said that the 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 creepiest thing that you will see this year, at least, is in this movie. So I'm there waiting the entire film for it, and I'm in the dark. And when it happens, there's just no doubt that yep, that's what they were talking about. Well, there's a couple like the video they find. Yeah, that's pretty broken. Yeah, I'm just like, what? And then, like, the whole finale of the film. I was about to say, the whole end of that, where she's talking to herself, um, all of that is just nope town. And quick side note, one of the most frustrating feelings ever as a film fan is watching a trailer hearing, like, great music in it, and it never showing up in the film. Yes. But the trailer for Annihilation... That was the actual score. And I remember when that started playing towards the end, I'm just like, yeah, there it is. <laughs> there it is. It's that like, bugs me when trailers do that. Womp. I'm just like, and when it started so, happening, I'm like, I am. Yep. I know what's going on here? <laughs> it's the best kind of science. Oh, it's good right? stuff. It is. The stuff, yeah, it just makes you go, what? what? <laughs> now, do you have any particular favorite filmmakers? Um, I'm yeah, I do. <laughs> Chris, uh, I'm, it's such a hard one to pin down, but Chris Nolan has my number. Mm-hmm. Anything he does, and it, it will probably be at the minute on a lot of people's the top of a lot of people's lists. But um, Dunkirk is one of my all-time favorite films. Um, that is a it's not a film; it's a work of art. Like what he crafts together with the I know the, the timings can put some people off but when you've watched it five times trust me you, you forget about all of that and it just it works it is just a piece of poetry that works with a score that is anxiety inducing in the best possible way um that that movie is just near perfect to me and that's not even his best movie <laughs> it's insane well I have a fun story about the soundtrack for Dunkirk because um, my coworker Steve and I were trying to do a test on some students on how music would affect them in a like a mm-hmm. test situation. Oh no, like, you did not! And he's like, "I really like. We need to find some music." I'm like, "I think I have some," <laughs> and I put Supermarine on. They're like. Oh, no. <laughs> And apparently the feedback was it was very stressful. Yeah, do you think? <laughs> Everybody failed that semester. So, worth it. <laughs> it's in the name of science. Well, so like it wasn't for an actual class. So we were just messing okay, around with enough. like because we support stan- some standardized tests and we're trying to think mm-hmm. like we are just practicing on some students who are really to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh man, I cannot imagine doing that. That would have I get very nervous during the exams anyway, but I well, would have broken me. walked out of Dunkirk oh, no, in yeah. IMAX because it was just it's a lot. too much. Yeah, And I got to see a 70 millimeter print of it, which was <gasps> really cool. Yeah, because he did all sorts of odd, thing, odd things, filming for IMAX and filming the entire film. Yeah, and I was ready for Tenant to enjoy on that. And like, that's what I was waiting for. Wound up watching my next uh, drive-in, which was the. I felt like that oh, was no. the strangest film to possibly watch at a drive-in. 
because like I felt like I was sitting in my car knowing like Christopher Nolan is somewhere like he feels a disturbance <laughs> in the force like somebody isn't appreciating this film properly somebody's watching my movie on a screen draped over a bunch of shipping <laughs> containers at a navy yard because that's yeah, exactly listen. where I watched it nice <laughs> listening to the the audio through the, the car stereo which yeah cool positive I got to change it nice <laughs> yeah just that's definitely positive oh my goodness that's the one positive of watching it in the Na- uh, at the navy yard was like I could actually control the volume and it's just like they started <sighs> talking again I'm like <laughs> like turn it yeah. up that is my biggest dis one of is it my biggest yeah I think it is my biggest cinematic disappointment I was so ready for for Tenet to be Inception meets Dunkirk in terms of filmmaking and Mm. it just was not I I appreciate it's not a bad movie yeah exactly I know sitting there listening to some of the dialogue knowing that it was written at us Mm -hmm. and I'm just like dude you're up your own ass at this point. <laughs> oh, and that's exactly it. Nobody told him to stop. He didn't have anyone saying, this may not be quite right. He just went full Nolan. Don't think about it. Just feel it. Like, don't, yeah. me tell, don't tell me how to live my life and how to watch my movie. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> like, and that was the thing, because, like, <clears throat> I didn't really connect with any characters that much, because, like, no. there were no characters. They were literally just... And I love Washington. I think he's fantastic, but I just could not get on board with him in this movie. Couldn't do it. They get to watch a giant plane smash into an airport. Yay! For real. Yay! Yes, he did. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, it was like, I remember when the score started playing, I'm like, this doesn't quite sound like Hans Zimmer, but it does have the bombast. Yeah, exactly. It's got the trailer. Boom, 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 that you need. But that was about it. And like I it was it was an interesting experience. And like I'm a huge Nolan fan too. Mm-hmm. And like I love the prestige. I love Interstellar. I yeah. love and like Korean films. There was just and Dunkirk's between Dunkirk and 1917, something in the water <laughs> about making some- that they were the same year, weren't they? Or consecutive years? Consecutive years, yep. Yeah, 1917 is, I keep forgetting it's not a Nolan film. I keep thinking it is because it's right up his alley as well. Um, That film's fantastic. It's not entirely in real time, fine, but they do a good enough job of making that a one shot that it may as well be. Well, he might have not have had Hoyt von Hoytema, but he had the Deacons. (laughs) (laughs) Which... If you've ever watched anything that I've done on here, like my whole entire time talking about the Coen brothers, I'm just like, Deacons. Deacons. (laughs) And it's just like, when you have a great cinematographer and a great eye from a director, magic happens. And Yeah, you're going to get a movie. Now, do you have any particular favorite actors or actresses? Um, yeah, I, whenever we do like a fantasy casting on, on my podcast, um, I always get stick for, okay, so who's Tom Hardy playing in this film? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's the remake of The Great Escape that we're going to be creating, or it's A Clockwork Orange, Pretty Woman. He's going to be in that movie. Uh, Tom Um, Hardy is the man. When are they greenlighting this Great Escape remake with Tom Hardy in it? (laughs) Uh, immediately uh, they need to I'm going to copyright it you can't put this video out until I've talked to my people because this has got to happen but the man oh, they can have do my money so everything. fast <laughs> take it take my money um, he can do everything he is he's actually playing me right now um, Ian couldn't make it this is actually Tom Hardy <laughs> playing Ian um, he's so good he's so mm. so good but he doesn't seem to have the and I'm going to be a bit cruel he doesn't quite seem to have the arrogance of Uh, Christian Bale and I put them on kind of similar levels Christian Bale can do no wrong by me but oh man the guy seems like a bit of a jerk (laughs) but Tom Hardy I'm just like ah you just seem like a nice guy as well as a fantastic actor I remember like I remember going into watching Peaky Blinders 
Mm -hmm. And like, I heard great things about the show of Killian Murphy, Mm -hmm. but outside of that, and, and like, I remember season two and all of a sudden that camera tracking on these broad shoulders, I'm like, those are Tom Hardy shoulders. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and just the walk and just and Alfie Solomons became like character numero uno for me. <laughs> just like... Yeah, he again he surpassed that TV show. Like, I feel like Killian Murphy in any any other show in the world, he steals it and he's fantastic. But Tom Hardy pops in and suddenly Peaky Blinders is all about him. Uh unreal. So so good. That's why he just keeps coming back. Yeah. And he is genuinely the best part about Nemesis. Uh, Nemesis, uh, Star Trek Nemesis, does not deserve Sir Patrick Stewart and Tom Hardy and what they're doing. Like, you, I don't think they even knew the cameras were rolling. They were just talking to each other. It's so, so good. And there, it's like, I'm a huge Mad Max fan. Mm-hmm. And it's like, on the on the surface, you probably think it's not like, oh, it's not too hard to figure out who would replace Mel Gibson as Mad Max. But then you watch Tom Hardy as Mad Max, and you're just like, who else would this be? Yeah, and <laughs> just, how is he doing it better? <laughs> just the grunting. Like, that's the thing, because, like, Max doesn't talk a whole lot. Like, I'm pretty sure he has, like, ten lines in The Road Warrior, like, the whole entire movie. <laughs> and doesn't have a whole lot in Fury Road either. Nope. <laughs> and just the... Like the fact that you can hear him, it's like, you almost shot off my head. <laughs> like just him <laughs> screaming from the front of the car is just like, yeah, I feel that. Yeah, absolutely. And he, whatever he's acting in, whatever he's doing, he sells it. He just 100% believes. Like uh, uh, Bronson is a disturbing film to watch. Really, you need to be in the, the right mindset for that. There's trigger warnings everywhere. But he is just in that movie. He is Bronson. Um, legend where he's playing both of the crazed twins. Like, yep. Yeah. I'll do that. It's fine. I'm going to play the twins. Well, we've got someone else that could play one of them. No, no, no. I got it. I'll do both. Yeah. And um, I remember because, like, obviously everybody remembers the Revenant because, like, Leo mm-hmm. won his Oscar. Yeah. But Fitzgerald, like, when Tom yeah. Hardy's talking about him getting scalped and stuff like that, I'm just like, Where's Tom Hardy's Best Supporting Actor Oscar for this? I, I think he was robbed. I sh- he should have had lead. Like, even as supporting actor, he turned into the lead. He stole the film. Um, I, I, and he hasn't, he hasn't won an Oscar, has he? Has he even been nominated? He did get nominated for The Revenant. But that okay, might fair be it. I, it's a crime. Absolute crime. I, I don't know if it's like... Because, like, what's he doing now, Venom? Venom. I, he's not picking the prestige pictures. This is exactly why Hugh Jackman keeps getting snubbed as well. Like he, because he does stuff like Wolverine and basically whatever the heck he wants. I feel like he doesn't get talked about in the serious. Oh, best I circles. would have given him an Oscar for Prisoners. Oh, ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that film again. Trigger warnings. That is a masterpiece. You're giving Oscar you will not to spend a bit in that movie. Anyone in that film. Um, literally, the car that's parked over. Yeah. You know, you know the car. Yeah. That car gets. I know Oscar. what car you're talking about. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> would have given it to the tree that Roger yeah. Deakins just looms on. <laughs> oh. That final. Oh, oh, it's so good. Um, you will not spend a better three hours. And that film is, uh, I think it's three hours long, isn't it? Two and a half? I think it's a good two it's and a half long. hours. Yeah. It's, and it, there's no need for it to be that long, but I'm glad it is. Well, and it's a, and that's the thing, because, like, it's a drama. Like, yes. it's a thriller, because, like, how intense it is. But, like, yeah. it's not, like, you're not watching Blade Runner or Dune or something. No, absolutely not. It's, Denis Villeneuve's just like, you're going to see it for the whole two and a half hours. And you're not going to yep. have any emotion left after yep. this movie. <laughs> you're going to hate me, yourself, every character, and you're going to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be afraid of Hugh Jackman for forever. Because I just, oh man, I just like to think that Hugh Jackman reads a part and decides whether he needs to grow a beard for this part or not. 
And if it's something really aggressive, he gets the beard growing in me. He's like, oh yeah, I'm going to need a big beard for this one. That goatee <laughs> that he has in it. So intimidating. And like, the, here's the thing. You put him in like normal roles. He still looks like, like Jack. He looks like a monster of a human being. Yeah. I mean, just so like, I just watched Reminiscence a couple of weeks ago, which I think is a hugely underrated. I know it's only been out a couple of weeks, but mm-hmm. that is not getting talked about nearly enough. It's got issues, but I really, really enjoyed it. And he's kind of meant to be a bit washed up and a bit feeling sorry for himself. And he's still this absolutely ripped Wolverine of a man. <laughs> You couldn't like, even turn you it can't down. can't hide like this. this. No, and it's just, just like ripping out the shirts. It's like watching Bad Education, which I was a huge fan of last mm. year on HBO. And like he's a pr- like he's a principal of a school, and you're just so like ripped. It's just like why are you so big? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it's like Tom Hardy and Lawless. I'm like, what? Yes. Where did you find the weights in yeah. Prohibition era? Like you just you find a way. Life finds a way. <laughs> yeah. Those weights found their way over to Tom Hardy. They did. Absolutely. That that cardigan wasn't keeping them in. It wasn't doing anything. No. no. I love a good cardigan. <laughs> now, Ian, what's a film that you could literally watch any day? Um, you're gonna judge me for this because it probably says something about my psyche, but <laughs> whiplash. <laughs> Well, you need to get pumped up every day. <laughs> that <works>. Yeah, <sighs> like that is um, uh, uh, Damien uh, Damien Chazelle. Yep. Yeah, Damien Chazelle doing a Denis Villeneuve, and just you're gonna feel things. You're gonna sit down. You're gonna buckle in. You're gonna hate yourself. You're gonna hate everyone in this movie. You're gonna thank me for it. Um, it is a masterpiece of. Um, it's a masterpiece um, character study of of abuse and victims and how you deal with your family, how your parents have messed you up, how you try and find another father figure and he messes you up. Um, everything about this film is broken and brilliant. I love it. You'll never be able to hear the yellow M&M the same way ever again. No, never. <laughs> the fact that J.K. Simmons... like, oh, don't... He's so good. This man is the yellow M&M. And all the yep. Eminem commercials, and like <laughs> fifty million other people and characters and movies, yep. and like growing up watching the Spider-Man films and just being like J. Jonah Jameson, yeah. And then he's he's bald and he's ripped in this movie inexplicably. Like there's no need for him to be this ripped, but he is. No, um, it's just I love perf- it. If- everything no, in his existence <laughs> is perfection. That's yeah, the only absolutely. thing that Fletcher has going here. That's exactly it. He, everything about him has to be controlled. Um, my, my entire family know to duck when I say, eh, not my tempo. And then the entire room just hits the deck because I'm going to launch something. Ah, uh, this chicken's good, but it's not my tempo. Oh, and it's so disturbed. And like, she wasn't the one off with it, tempo, but she didn't know she wasn't. Oh, yeah, it's the, the one that's out of tune. I was like, she wasn't out of tune. You were, but she didn't know, which is just as bad. Oh, it's so because he ruins this person, ruins it, and there was nothing wrong. And then caravan. Oh, just the the look of dread on Miles Teller's face, and then Fletcher just loving it. Like, come on, and Fletcher sabotaging himself as much, and the entire the entire company as much as he is miles but he doesn't care this is yep this is what i'm gonna do tonight yep and then and then and the the finale like oh you just get chills because he's with no words at all they go from complete enemies to unwilling allies to yep we're going to war together and we're in this all through the course of a drum solo. How do you do that? You're just like, did we b- just become best friends? <laughs> yup. <laughs> yeah, we did, but we still hate each other. Um, but I, I have a, I have a, I have a theory about the end of the film, and it's that um, he never plays drums again. That was it. Um, after that solo, he puts his sticks down. Done. I'm gonna walk go and spend stage. some time with my dad. Walk off stage. 
I'm going to get Supergirl. We're going to live happily ever after. And I think that would be the biggest F you to Fletcher. Because you know Absolutely. Fletcher's going to want him in his band. And oh, yeah. He like, was going to want him, yeah. It's like, He'll be he wanting to be on tour together. Goodbye. <laughs> I, I'm picking up the recorder. That's the only thing that I'm going to play. <laughs> going to play the Jurassic Park theme. <laughs> on recorder. Brilliant. Now, Ian, what's a film? Oh, God. That video <laughs> on YouTube is... Oh, it's good. Yeah, that's some stuff. And Titanic, oh, the Titanic theme yes. on recorder. Um, now, Ian, what's a film that you feel like you connect to closely because it relates to another interest of yours? Um, this was a really, really easy one to jump to. So um, for a long, long time, my main hobby was rock climbing. Okay. And in the last seven or eight years, it's disappeared because life happens and you have to do that stupid thing where you get a job and you get a mortgage and then you give up your job to be a writer and then that takes a while to start doing things. yeah um so you you kind of free time disappears a bit but um so i was a rock climbing instructor at a summer camp in america for a summer um, and did a bit back here as well so 127 hours is a film that speaks to my soul and is very very triggering to watch um yeah. so i have a story so mm -hmm. i was in film club in college and they played this in film club mm -hmm. and i was sitting in the front row i passed out oh man yeah watching I it blame you. and no nobody judgment. noticed because i was sitting like this and I conked out and my arms are stuck like this and my head was resting <laughs> on my hands. I came to like, like a minute oh, or two man. later and I was drenched. Yeah. And like. Was it when he's cutting through the nerves? Yep. Was that the, yep, that's the yep. second. That's the, yep, yep. <laughs> I'm afraid of needles. I'm afraid of sharp objects like that. And that was like, I think one of the most visceral uses of a sharp object i've ever watched in oh, film, which says a lot about the film oh 100 like, and I'm the problem like, is it's it's not a sharp object either that's that's the real problem it isn't it isn't the sharp object it needs to be so i read the book so when i was at university i was um i uh, ran the uh, the there was a mountaineering club and i ran the rock climbing element of it mm -hmm. and we would go away for a weekend and stay in these huts in the middle of wales or the peak district or yorkshire or somewhere um and of course invariably these huts had the book 127 hours in them just because some people like to watch the world burn and oh. th this book has pictures in it because obviously it, it's a true story as i think pretty much everyone knows um this this book has pictures of it that he took while he was there so it has it has a selfie of him with his arm under the boulder um it had he managed to turn around as he left his arm behind spoiler um he took a picture of the boulder and his the bit of the bone coming out of the boulder as well and his journey back um and the way he describes it in in the book is just it it's stunning because he's so calm about it and i know you can be calm when you're looking back at it and you're removed from it but he's he even describes how calm he was in the moment so this is almost like the martian he just tries to science his way through everything so what isn't in the film is that he creates a really elaborate pulley system that nearly works it, it does move the rock but it actually makes the rock move down and get even more stuck um and he said his biggest regret was that he the pen knife the multi-tool that he had he was using the sharpest blade to chip away at the rock and it was only when that blade was completely dull that he wished he still had that sharp blade to cut his arm off so he was doing that with a, a dull instrument as well it's but yeah james franco does an excellent job in this film um yeah it's a, it's a one-man opera it's so good <laughs> definitely hits definitely hits exactly how it's meant to hit and potentially knock you out yeah <laughs> there you he go. makes all the mistakes like he he admits it himself he makes all of the mistakes he didn't tell anybody where he was going it wasn't a registered route 
Um, he had no plans for the next five days to meet anybody. Like he, every rookie mistake that they tell you not to make. <sighs> and there you go. Made for a good movie. Sure did. Now, what movie character do you feel like you connect with on a personal level? There's so many because I think we see ourselves in in our heroes and we see ourselves, that's why they're our heroes. We, we aspire to be like them. So I could say Tony Stark, I could say Captain Picard, but the, the one that got me on a really day-to-day mundane level was Locke. Um, Tom Hardy again. Yep. Um, not because I've ever had to leave my job and drive to London because of a, a woman that I've impregnated. No, that's never happened. It's more just how he has to manage everything from his phone and from this mm-hmm. car journey. He's very, he has a single-minded mission. He's going to get to London. He's made his decision. This is the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it. And he's just going gonna to get there, and he's going to see this woman. Now, in my job before Cinema Sins, it was um, a store manager for a DIY shop. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always have to be on the phone. And the amount of disasters that I've had to sit in my car as I'm driving somewhere, and I, I have to ring 10 people on speakerphone to sort out these very complex problems that I'm sure the very competent people that I left behind could have been able to do it. They can't do it. So it has to be me in the car. So it's so dumb, but I just, whenever I watch that film, I'm just like, I feel your pain, Tom Hardy. (laughs) Why have these people let you down? (laughs) It's got to use that phone. And speaking of Tom Hardy and carrying a, what, probably like an 80, 85 minute film of him just driving in a car on the phone. Could do it all. It's such a hard sell. Like when this was recommended to me, I was like, I, I don't know how I'm going to sit down and watch this because so the strip of road that he's driving on is the sh- is my commute to work. So those junctions on the motorway are are exactly the same junctions that I drive. He drives past almost my house in that film. So I was like, why am I now going to spend my free time watching a man do the commute that I am doing in the morning? <laughs> it's like I'm going to do this later. Yeah, I already, I already watched it. There yeah, you amazing. go. Yeah, done. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's so much more than that <laughs> it's so much more so so good that's such a deep film now ian what's a film that you love that you feel like would surprise people now this one is going to surprise people because i'm infamous on, on on my podcast for not liking romantic comedies i just they don't do it for me but for some reason pretty woman does because <laughs> how can you deny julia roberts She's adorable. She's so this film, full disclosure, this film has so many issues. Richard Gere's character is not a nice man. He's he's buying Julia Roberts. And Julia Roberts is, yes, there's love, but she is allowing her services to be purchased. And yeah, it covers a lot of com- complex stuff. I don't think it handles feminism particularly well. It does some things quite well, but for some reason, you put all that to one side, the romance and the chemistry between them and just how natural Julia Roberts is just gets me every time. And I'm not a crier, but there are scenes in this that get me right there. Um, so people, I, I go into that description and people are waiting for the punchline at the end of it and me to actually say the actual film that I like. But no, it is, it's Pretty Woman. I won't openly admit that, but... I really like that film. <laughs> well, I'm appearing on Ben Davis, Ben from Soon mm. Pop, his podcast, and we were talking about forgetting Sarah Marshall. I'm like, I will not talk about that film. Not a fan. <laughs> not so it's Russell Brand. I'm not and who's the other lead? Um Jason oh, Siegel? Yes, I'm just not a fan. It's just one of those. Yeah, nails well, on a chalkboard. Sometimes board. the weather outside is weather. Yeah. <laughs> just like his acting. Sometimes <laughs> it's just there. And it was interesting because we talked a lot about Russell Brand because apparently it was supposed to be Charlie Hunnam. Oh, really? I probably would have enjoyed that more. I would have been a very different character. Oh, because Russell Brand, you're casting Russell Brand to be Russell Brand. Like, you can't 
tell him how to act. Just go and be you and we'll keep the camera rolling. And like I, so pre, interesting enough, pre Lost City of Zed, I was not a fan of Charlie Hunnam. Mm -hmm. Like I watched Pacific Rim. I'm like, why is this piece of wood walking around (laughs) as the main character in this movie? Does he know he's acting in this? (laughs) And but like between Lost City of Zed, I enjoyed him in the King Arthur movie that Guy Ritchie made. I'm like, I think he brought some <laughs> charisma. That was a hot mess of a movie, though. Oh, that's a bad film. <laughs> but I love him in The Gentleman. Like honestly, oh, I love everyone in The Gentleman. <laughs> but like, yeah, that is a good film, man. That is Guy Ritchie returned to form. Um, yep. that's a great movie. Oh. I never thought, and speaking of romantic comedies, Hugh Grant. Whoever yes. thought that Hugh Grant <laughs> and like, because like, I never watched any of his romantic comedies growing up. Like, I think the only one that I actually own is Four Weddings and a Funeral. Four Weddings and a Funeral, which yeah. I love that. Yeah. But like, what he's doing now with like, God, in Paddington 2, Phoenix Buchanan, it's the he's greatest- a great villain. Is the greatest villain of all time. Yeah, he 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 beats he beats um uh, Khan. He beats Fletcher. He's an evil evil man. Yes. And <laughs> what, what like, broke Hugh Grant for me was Cloud Atlas. Yeah. Because he is off the rails in that film. Um, Between the asshole brother of Jim Broadband yeah. who puts him in yes. a home. Puts him in a home. It's so good. Um. <laughs> The cannibal leader. Yeah. Like, I remember pictures of him before that. I'm like, no, I saw pictures him. of him and of yeah. um, Hugo Weaving in the movie beforehand. I'm like, mm-hmm. what's this movie? <laughs> <laughs> what am I watching? <laughs> and like, stuff like The Undoing that was on HBO, which is like probably the sleaziest of television that I watched, but it was such well-made sleaze. Yeah. And Hugh Grant was so great in it, but, like, what he's doing with his career, and him is... His name was Fletcher, too. <laughs> in The Gentleman. <laughs> he's like, yes! He's just like, come play with me, Raymond. <laughs> and it's just like... <laughs> that Having him narrate the movie was genius. Oh, a stroke of genius. And you can tell he's just, this is what he wants to do. He's fed up of being the bumbling Englishman and he just wants to say the C word as much as possible in the latter stages of his career. The, him and Charlie Hunnam bouncing back and forth with each other was fantastic. So um, oh, Colin Farrell <laughs> as coach in that. And so good. He's another one. Like, I was not a fan of his early on. Like, I'm watching Daredevil. I'm mm. like, oh no, he's garbage in that movie. It's no, like, well, really to be fair, most, most of that yeah, movie most of that. Why is like, oh, poor Ben Affleck? Like, what was what? Just yeah. Like, I feel like outside of Michael Clark Dun- Duncan, nobody likes anything at that movie. No, I don't and, think so. But like between In Bruges and Seven yeah. Psychopaths, and he Colin Farrell broke my heart in Saving Mr. Banks. Like, watching him as her father was, like... Oh. He's got way more range than we give give him credit for. He surprised me really bizarre, Paul. He was in... Uh, he had a short cameo in Scrubs. I think he's in one episode of Scrubs as a drunk Irishman that gets into a fight with JD. And that's when I was just like, wow, you just you don't even... You're a big Hollywood actor and you're doing this. You just want to have fun. Like, I think he's just one of those actors that throws himself into every part. And I just, I have so much fun every time I watch The Gentleman, he's just like, make it sharp. Cook me with it. (laughs) And it's just like, and just like, he's egging them on. It's like, come on. You gotta do better than this. But he's he's chasing the kids that have run off with, what do they run off with? Is it a phone? Something he's trying to get back from them. And he's got like a machine gun in his inner jacket. Oh, yeah. Charlie like, Hunnam just like, around. pulls out a yes. machine gun yeah. and starts shooting up in the air. Stop effing around. <laughs> yep. And oh, uh, that was such a blast. That was yeah, one film. of the few films I got to see in theaters before mm. the apocalypse Everything. happened. Everything. Last yeah. year. 
Oh, uh, but so that good. was a great time. Well, speaking of great times, it has been one. And my last question for you is, what okay. do you love most about movies? Um, I'm. It's probably the uh, answer that's been given a thousand times, but it's the most accessible way to communicate stories. So you can, we have an endless amount of stories and it's just, it's the very first thing we learned to do as humans, with cave paintings. Before we even had words, we were telling stories through pictures. Now we've got pictures that move. Moving pictures. Um, <laughs> moving pictures, the talkies. Um, it's just, I don't know how you can't like movies. I, I get the, some people really struggle with being sat down for a length of time, but look what's being put in front of you. Like it can be quite literally anything. And how can you, the only thing that's going to top that is when we get the holodecks from Star Trek and then you will lose me. And I think 99% of the population, I, we will have a genuine society problem when holodecks are real. Cause why would you leave? If you can be inside your favorite movie, I'm never leaving the DeLorean. I'm sorry. <laughs> To be run away from all kinds of things in Middle Earth. <laughs> yeah. I may not pick Middle Earth. There's a lot there that's going to kill me. <laughs> One does not simply walk into Middle Earth. <laughs> oh, all the Boromir memes. So oh, many he's of them. so good. He's the unsung hero of those films. That that film. He's only in one of them. <laughs> not if you watch the extended edition. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. I haven't got 14 hours spare today, I'm afraid. To be perfect, like, I understand why they cut that sequence out in Two Towers. I still love it. Mm. It gives okay. a lot of depth. But, like, there's also a lot of scenes where I'm like, yeah, yeah. this should not have been in the movie. Like, 99% yeah. of Gimli's extra comic relief scenes where they just make him a complete clown. yeah. It's much better, few and far between. Don't yeah. tell the elf. Yeah, still much only much counts better. as one. Is yeah. good enough for me. <laughs> Brilliant. So good. Could, would you like me to get you a box? <laughs> You're such a bad person. <laughs> now, how I wrap up the show every week is allowing my guests to ask me a question. Ooh, brilliant! Um, so, what would you like to ask the Wasteland reviewer? Okay, if okay, you had somebody that had you alien coming to Earth, have okay. never watched a film before. What is the one film that you would watch? Sit down and watch with them. One, this is your one opportunity to show them what humanity can do. It's funny, I'm looking off into my wall to look at all the posters that I have <laughs> yeah, hanging here. Get inspiration. Well, I, if I showed them The Godfather, they get wrong ideas nope. about Italian people. Yep. I think, well, <laughs> just humans in general. Yeah, like, is this what all of you guys are like? Is like no, 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 just the Italians. No, even better. <laughs> this good fellas. Even yeah. worse. <laughs> it's the worst. Um, I, uh, <laughs> do I want them to stay? You want them just... to, I mean, <laughs> you want them to, uh, it depends. You want them to be impressed by us and what we can do. But not so impressed that they want to conquer us. <laughs> I have a facetious answer that I'm going to say in a second, but okay. <laughs> I feel like if I could show them any film to show them what we really could do, I'm going to show them 2001 A Space Odyssey. It just like, yeah, get, I think get that's this fair. idea. We never went in space. And look what we came up with. Uh-huh. This is just our imagination. And then it comes out and says, oh, that was us. The the the, the big black thing. That was, whoops. We did that. And it's just like, <laughs> well, thanks, buddy. Yeah. You're the reason we have Mars. Helped us along. Yeah. Uh, my facetious answer would 100% be the world's end. God, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's even better. Oh, man. Because it's like, <laughs> look, look how stupid we are. <laughs> Leave yeah, us alone. Just get out of here. With this. Just <laughs> you go. don't even want to bother with us. But just don't do what they did. No. <laughs> don't blow us up on your way out. Please. That's Please so don't good. do that. I think I like that answer better. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
So obviously the Cornetto trilogy is so popular among people. And of course. generally, if you ask people, which one's your favorite, most people are going to pick either Shaun of the Dead or Hot Fuzz. Of course. Yeah. For me, as a huge science fiction fan, I love the world's end so much. Yeah. And I appreciate the maturity of it of like dealing with them actually growing older and having to grow up it's great well and trying to grow up and some of them just not yeah between simon Pegg, nick frost and patty considine yelling at bill nye <laughs> giant space voice it's so good and bill nye just being like well f it <laughs> <laughs> and just i'm so on. done with this <laughs> and like of course pierce brosnan's in it so like i loved a, a sneaky pierce brosnan cameo is always welcome he sneaks up in places and you're like well, <laughs> how much well, do they pay you to do that because like i've been watching james bond movies since i was eight years old mm -hmm. which probably not the best thing but you know <laughs> i'm a functioning adult so we turned out fine um but like <laughs> i grew up watching goldeneye all the yeah. time and pierce brosnan was my favorite bond growing up i played goldeneye and the thing yeah. is he could be that a bit intimidating he was had the charm which is so great and like i just wish they gave him better movies i he's got like i tomorrow never dies is my all-time favorite bond film it is a for me it is a masterpiece i love it but I appreciate it a lot more than I think most people give it credit for. Cause like, um, Jonathan Price, that it's villain, all about Jonathan Price. He's the best Bond villain ever. And like, it's very, like, it hits close to home. Cause like, you know, our lives with 24 hour news cycles and we're just like, there's it the is real more, villains. Yeah. If you watch that right now, it is more prescient than ever. He just runs a newspaper. Yeah. That's the real villain. And he wants to create the news. Yeah. Come on! I mean, this is happening today! Yeah. And, like, I really enjoy it a lot. Um, I watched The World Is Not Enough a lot <laughs> growing mm -hmm. up as a kid. Obviously, like, Denise Richards, oh. not the best edition. <laughs> no. But again, um, your bad guy, I've forgotten his name. Was it uh, Renard? No. Oh, I'm going to have to pull this up. Because, like, was it Robert Carlyle plays... Him? Robert Carlyle, yes. Yeah. yeah, he's your your man with the bullet in his brain. Yeah, well, and I, Electra not... Like, Electra was a... Gr Electra King was a great idea. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. works so well. And I'm like, you don't get a whole lot of, like, straight-up villainous... Like that in a Bond movie. No. And I'm a huge fan of Robbie Coltrane and, like, Valentin favorite minor character in Jim so Bond good. movies. Screw Felix. We don't need him. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, and then, sure, jump the shark and die another day. My goodness. It's just, ah, uh, Die Another Day is summed up by Madonna's theme song for it. It, it just tries too hard. And you know what the worst part is? The cold open is amazing it's fantastic that is ballsy torturing bond is brilliant and then all went downhill from there yeah. and then, and the biggest problem is that they forget that he was tortured like it is not it is not referred back to the entire opening music scene is about his torture and what's happening and how m has to bring him back but didn't agree with the with the with the bargain and then we'll, we'll just move on and forget that ever happened. If they referred back to it, it would have been brilliant. I felt like if we sat down and showed aliens all of James Bond, they'd get horrible ideas about humanity. Oh, they would, I think what they would do is they would take all of the women and then blow up all of the men. <laughs> is exactly what would happen if we did that. Yep. Rightfully so. Yeah. <laughs> Stop <laughs> that. But that was a great question. Oh, uh, dear. I want you to be there when I show them the world's end. And I'll, see, I'll, <laughs> see I'll be passed react. out. I'll be passed out at the front, just on my, on my hands. You won't realize I've passed out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my.
But Ian, this is a lot of fun and I appreciate you coming on and I'll definitely love to have you on for like round two. Yeah, absolutely. Coming back around. But tell all the lovely people watching where to find you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Loads and loads and loads of fun. Um, you can find me on Twitter at galactic underscore Dave. Um, that's where I'm most active. Um, anything in the Sif Pop and Cinema Sins universe, come and find Ian. Um, I'm there. <laughs> awesome. And Ian, again, thank you for coming on. And thank, thank all you of you me. out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer. <laughs>